Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Good afternoon, and on behalf of the Grand Rounds Faculty Committee, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's presentations. Uh, this program is actually, as many of you know, uh, part of our curriculum, uh, the D1, D2, 515, 616 course, as well as for the third and fourth year students, the 710 and 810 course. So this is actually a part of the curriculum for our guests who are with us this afternoon. The focus of the program is not so much on specific content that will be presented, but more of, of an opportunity for some collegial learning, a little bit of assessment of a topic, a little critical thinking, um, to kind of bring the students and our faculty a little bit closer together than what we usually might get in one of our lecture rooms. As with any program of this magnitude, uh, obviously I get to sit here and thank you and for being here, but obviously there was a lot more people involved to put this on. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Murdoch Kinch in the Office of Academic Affairs, uh, specifically Jeannie Boyer, uh, Misty Graveland, and Sherry McCune for a lot of the logistics to make this happen, as well as uh, Rich Feshett and the Office of Continuing Education and Carol Barton and their efforts to make this uh, a successful event for us. One other group I'd like to thank are the laboratories uh, who are part of the sponsor for today's program. You saw them out in the lobby, and we'd like to encourage you to visit the tables, talk with them. Um, they're very excited about our new endeavors in the digital dentistry areas and some of the services and restorations that they can help provide for us in the treatment of our patients. So we'd encourage you, um, when we have the chance later on this afternoon, to spend some time talking with them, get a feel for the types of things that they can do with our digital systems. Now, addition, in addition to the Grand Rounds curriculum, obviously we have these mega Grand Rounds programs, one in the fall and one in the winter, and I want to announce the one that we're going to have this winter so you can mark it on your calendars. Uh, the Department of Perio and Oral Medicine is going to sponsor the one that you see up above called Personalized Medicine. And it's going to be on Wednesday, March 28th. Again, we're going to use the Wednesday afternoon time period so it doesn't interfere with the, uh, the clinics the rest of the week. Um, and we obviously have a distinguished group of speakers that will share their perspective on this interesting development in our healthcare practices these days. Now today's program is titled Restorative Dentistry in a Digital World. We're going to, just to kind of lay out the format for this afternoon, we'll have a series of three speakers. Um, there'll be a little bit of a natural break between them as we get the, the computer set up. Um, but we're not going to take a break during the afternoon. We're going to try to keep the session moving along rather than extend the afternoon. With that in mind, we're also going to ask you to hold your questions for the speakers until the panel discussion occurs at the end of the third presentation. And one last thing, all the electronic devices that you might have that will ring or buzz or things of that nature, we'd appreciate if you would turn them off at this point. We don't really need for you to be connected to the internet to uh, use the eye clicker or anything of that nature today. At this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Bain, who is the chair of the Department of Cariology, Restorative Sciences, and Endodontics, and is the host of today's session on behalf of the department. And so I'd like to welcome him to the podium to say a few words. Steve. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks. What I thought I'd do is sort of uh, set the stage for this afternoon. Um, I'm old enough to now have been involved in this process of digital dentistry for 25 years. So I want to give you a perspective of where we are, sort of where we're going, what some of the challenges are there are, are that are out there, and some of the things that our speakers are going to uh, uh, talk to this afternoon. Now this little caricature, this little cartoon that's showing up on the screen right now, is actually from 1985. It was published in one of the dental throwaway journals, and it was just about the time that people were beginning to think about how do you use computers in dentistry, and it was actually posed as a threat to the clinician. So if you look closely at this, you can see that there's not a clinician chair side. The clinician's over in the corner, standing in front of this big, humongous, old computer, uh, controlling everything from diagnosis, treatment, planning, treatment of the patient, whatever. Uh, but digital dentistry was, was not seen in the early days as a great savior for dentistry, as a great adjunct of aid, uh, but rather as a threat. Now, I'm going to take you back even a little bit further than this and, and show you a timeline. If you look back and <clears throat> look at this first block of time here, things that had to do with computer-controlled fabrication of stuff in industry here in Detroit and other places in the U.S. actually started right after the Second World War. 
We were building very primitive computer controlled equipment to build things for cars, for trains and whatever. So the technology has been around since about 1947. It took about 25 years before people in dentistry started to say, you know, we could really use some of this same stuff. There was an early article submitted to the Journal of the American Dental Association in 1972 um, by one of the upstarts in the US Air Force who was really into this stuff. And the journal turned him down and said, this is ridiculous. We're never going to use computers in dentistry. This has no place. Uh, they didn't even review the article. And so another 15 years or so went by. The people that pushed this whole topic forward were actually the Europeans. And the reason was at the time in Europe, in the 80s, there was this great threat. People were afraid of mercury and dental amalgam. And so they were looking for ways that they could replace a dental amalgam and milling ceramic looked like it would be a good alternative, low cost solution. And so the original devices were developed in Europe and then they started to appear in the United States in 1988 and 1989. Now, we go a little bit further downstream here. What are the challenges that you've got for the technology? And the speakers all today will talk to these things. There's really three things that are going on here. The first is, Whenever you're going to do something in the mouth, you've got to capture an image. Somehow you've got to know what the intraoral structures are, and it's got to be a very accurate image. Then you've got to be able to do a design on that image, and in most cases we think about doing this in virtual space. And then the last thing is you want to create something, you want to fabricate a restoration or whatever. So it's really that simple. Capture the intraoral information, do the, the, the CAD part or the computer assisted design part, and then do the manufacturing part. What we've seen over the last 20 or so years is development of more and more sophistication in doing each one of these things. But the early devices were doing this back in 1989. Now, uh, I show you this little picture here. In, at the very beginning, people were trying to say, well, what can we do? Do we make an amalgam restoration or a substitute for amalgam? Can we do crowns? Can we do bridges? This is the first milled crown ever made by Diane Rical at, at University of Minnesota in 1988. And this crown was made with a Black & Decker drill mounted in a press with a block of material being run by one of these little CAD packages underneath to, to show at least uh, reduction to practice that you could technically make a crown with a, a computerized controlled package. Now, uh, the interesting thing about this picture was I said, Diane, this is great. Send me the picture. So she sent it over the early part of what was later to be called the intranet because at that time it was DARPAnet. It was what the Defense Department was actually running. She sent me the image and it took two and a half days for that image to be translated over DARPAnet. And then I had the image in North Carolina and I said, well, let's print this out. Well, we didn't have printers at that time that handled graphics. And so it took hours to literally print this out. So one of our problems in the early stages was we didn't have all the technology in place that we do today. Uh, of course, the first thing that led the way was CIREC. Uh, I think you've seen generations of this, and, and this is something that the speakers will talk about as well. Uh, I was probably the leader in the field. It was designed, of course, to be an in-office package for creating a restoration. And one of the battles that we've seen now over the years is that there are alternative ways to make a restoration. CAD CAM is one way. It's what we call a subtractive process where you start with a block of material and then you cut it down to the size that you actually need. But there's all sorts of other ways that you can generate a restoration and I've listed some of these up here. They were all around in their early stages at least in the 1990s sort of range and they're being used by industry right now and they're being explored by dentistry as alternatives to our traditional CAD sort of manufacturing process. So there's all sorts of technology that's out there just waiting to take off. Now, um, if you look at the zones from 1990 on, the first thing that we really had to prove was that you could make a restoration that had some survivability, that was really competitive with the other things. And all these speakers today have been involved in this process. Dennis was one of the leaders in the field. He was one of the early adopters, learned the technology, has been doing this stuff for, for 20 years now. But it took a lot of proof of, of concept before the rest of dentistry really accepted things. There was another period from about 2002 on where there was a battle between the dental laboratories that wanted to be involved in this process and people that were trying to do things chairside. And the speakers will discuss that today. Now, the question is, where are we? Are we at a starting point, an ending point? You know, what's going to happen here? If you look at all the technology challenges that were out there, and I just list a few for you here right now. Uh, of course, we waited for personal computers. 
get this started here. We waited for personal computers, better graphics. You can sort of go down this list. We're now at the point where we have really high speed environments, wireless environments, people using the same data types and whatever, and everything's sort of coming together to our advantage. We're looking at newer materials, we're looking at alternative technologies that we can use, but truly this is the takeoff. So the future is just gonna be really exciting in terms of the things that we can do and, and all the capacity. So with that, I'm gonna turn the program over to uh, Mark Fitzgerald. Mark's the co-chair of CRSE, and Mark will be uh, the host and introduce the speakers. Mark. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.